Hello and welcome back to Cambro Conversations. Today's conversation, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Shane O'Mara from the University of Dublin Trinity College. Shane, thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, Colin. And we were talking beforehand that I'm somebody that's incredibly passionate about walking and all the different benefits that I've seen from it. But you're a man that's even more passionate about it than I am. And that's why I'm so excited to, to speak to you and have you on. But at the at the um, Trinity College Dublin, you are in the experimental brain research department, and that's quite a, a heavy title, isn't it? When you think about an activity as basic as as walking, so how on earth did walking become a part of such um, such high level research as that? Well, uh, I, I, obviously, I'm a brain scientist, and I'm interested in in brain function. And without a brain, you're not going to walk. Uh, <laughs> it's as simple as that. Uh, if you suffer uh, damage to uh, the brain through a stroke, that might impair your walking. If uh, you have spinal cord damage, for example, you might become uh, disabled and uh, unable to, to walk without uh, some form of assistive aid. So understanding how we move and how the brain controls movement is actually a, a really big and important agenda within uh, brain science because humans, unlike, you know, trees and flowers and all the all, you know these other living things we move around in the world and uh, we go from a stage when we're very helpless and we need others to move us when we're children uh, to a point where we can engage in independent mobility and we can define where we want to go in the world so um, the brain is centrally involved in all of those things and if uh, uh, you don't need to move you don't need a brain trees don't have brains flowers don't have brains mushrooms don't have brains yeah, it's it, it's it's incredible how you strip it back like that because when I've uh, read your book in praise of walking, one of the key things that stood out was that this unique aspect to humans in that we do walk from place to place and with the gait that we have, which is on two legs, we are extremely unique in that respect. Yeah, so he, it, there are other two-legged walkers, of course, uh, but our kind of walking is is very unique. Penguins, for example, uh, are two-legged walkers. Birds generally are, uh, but they don't have kneecaps, and uh, they they uh, the shape of the pelvis and all of the rest of it is very very different. Um, and our form of walking is actually, in energetic terms, extremely efficient. You know, uh, so kilo for kilo. Uh, we walk about four times as far per kilo uh, per calorie consumed as our nearest primate relatives. Uh, and this is because our position is, is upright. Uh, we don't knuckle walk, uh, so we don't drop our, our forearms and hands onto the ground in order to move quickly. Um, and we cast a very short shadow, uh, which is really important uh, because it, it means that the sun on our back as we move, uh, it, it, actually uh, ensure, or the, rather, the, uh, let me rephrase that from the start. Uh, because we can't cast such a short shadow, we don't absorb heat uh, in the same way that other creatures do when they're moving around. So if you think about the African noonday sun, we can walk around with relative safety in that sun, whereas tigers and other predators uh, actually look for shade and they stay in the shade during that time. Um, so we have lot, and we perspire, of course, uh, something that we we share with very few other creatures. So you know the kind of constraint where walking is concerned for us is is uh, do we have access to water? Do we have access to places of refuge? Otherwise, we can just get going at uh, uh, during the noonday sun, which is something that other creatures dislike doing. Yeah, we're almost uniquely positioned to walk in a way that other animals aren't, and in conditions that other animals and species aren't as well so it's very interesting how when we look back at our ancestry and our history over the periods of evolution which we've gone through walking is something that's remained fairly constant since our fairly early days yeah and not alone that but we are able to walk in environments that and uh, make adaptations to ourselves that other creatures can't so you know uh, uh how do we conquer the the icy steppes in russia well, we killed animals and we wrapped our fur around our feet uh, and uh, things like that, whereas uh, gazelles aren't going to do that uh, or tigers aren't going to do that. So we, we're very, very good at, at making adaptations, doing things like inventing shoes, inventing snowshoes, all sorts of other things that, that uh, we've done through the millennia that allow us to get to places that other creatures can't. So, you know, we have this kind of unique pattern of dispersion that's... Uh, other creatures haven't. And when other creatures have become dispersed, it's typically because they've, they've come along with us 
uh, you know, rats have followed us, uh, uh, dogs have followed us, but they naturally wouldn't necessarily have got to places uh, without us. I'm not saying we that's a good know. thing. It's just reality. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, a, a positive in some ways in terms of we've been, le we've been leading the way towards um, hopefully them continuing to be a species, whereas if we'd uh, extinct them, then it's a little bit different. We've clearly had this built into us from our ancestors, but in the modern world, the Western world in particular that we that we live in, Shane, we've lost a lot of the the benefits of walking along the way. What's changed so much that has meant that we don't walk as much as we maybe should nowadays? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a really important question and, and framing it in terms of our ancestors is, is, is really important. So if you think about the kind of conditions that our ancestors grew up under, um, food was not plentiful. Uh, you had to go out and work every day to get food. You had to hunt animals down. You had to dig tubers. You had to find honey. Uh, you had to, uh, if you harvested maize or whatever, you had to break it down. So food was a lot of work. Um, now, we've solved that problem in the modern world. Calories are everywhere. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you want to go and get uh, a small bar that has half of your daily calorie consumption, you can do that for uh, a euro or two. It's not, not a, a big deal. So we've solved that problem. But again, think about the context that we evolved in. Uh, calories were few. And when you got them, what did you do? You ate them and you rested. <laughs> so what we've done is, is uh, we, we have this inbuilt tendency that uh, makes perfect sense that uh, when you get food, you conserve your energy. Um, the problem is we've got lots of food and we don't have to expend much energy to get that food. So that's the difference. And uh, what we really need to do is try and build a world where uh, we encourage more movement, and we try also uh, to remove ultra processed foods from our everyday lives, uh, which is a hard thing. You know, they're really rewarding. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I won't name a, a particular brand, but you, you know what I mean. There, there are lots and lots of brands out there that are fantastic to eat. They give you a sugar hit that knocks you off your feet and is you've got lots of calories available straight away. Um, and uh, that's the kind of the problem that we, we've evolved into uh in the modern world yeah it's a a, a double-edged sword isn't it less movement and more easily accessible hyper palatable high calorie foods which give us those sensations and i've on a, on a slight tangent i was listening to dr andrew huberman talk about dopamine and our dopamine goes up 1.5 times when we have chocolate so yeah it's, it's, it's very very intensely, intensely rewarding um and and there's a reason for that you know your brain um or the 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 you know, the, the food centers in your brain, their job is to source food for you, you know, and to track down calories and especially rich calories. And uh, if, again, if you think about a hunter gatherer lifestyle, you have to hunt, you have to carve the meat, you have to bring it back, you have to prepare it. There's a lot of work involved in that. So you're burning calories, getting your food together. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're in an office environment, uh, all you need to do is take a coin or a card out, put it in the machine and out, lo and behold, you're getting the same calorific load as that guy or that girl or woman who's out there uh, carving up a beast or digging up tubers. It's it, it, it's a very, very different environment now. Exactly that. And one of the most fascinating aspects of your work, Shane, was around how cities and towns have been designed and how, of course, we give an example there of the office environment where, of course, we live a very sedentary lifestyle from that perspective. We're not forced to go and even you don't even have to walk particularly far to go and get a sandwich for your lunch even if you were going to choose something that's slightly more nutritionally dense than the the bar of chocolate from the the vending machine but importantly the structure of how we live day to day from terms of where our home is where our work is and everything like that has radically changed over the last period where we're encouraged less and less to actually walk and we're we've got much more how would you put it easy ways to transport ourselves yeah, so it, 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 it's worth thinking a little bit about our city. So after I wrote the book, I, I was asked a question about what amount of walking uh, did uh, people do, let's say, 100 years ago before mechanized transport became really popular. So you either walked, you used a bicycle or you used a horse. Uh, those were kind of your three options. And if you were a working person, well, where are you going to stable your horse? Uh, you probably couldn't afford a bike and you certainly didn't own a car. So you walked everywhere, or you might have used a train if you were, if you were lucky. Um, and it turns out that uh, day laborers in London, for example, 
uh, would typically walk four uh, miles approximately to work and four miles from work day in, day out. So that's about eight miles a day. Uh, and then assume you have to do a little bit of other stuff, uh, you know, uh, maybe passing by the bookies on the way home if you're so lucky or <laughs> the the, uh, the pub or whatever, uh, you might put in nine or 10 miles a day. So that that's something that humans can do and actually readily do. Uh, we adapt to walking those very long distances very, very quickly. And I, I give the case study in the book uh, at the start of uh, the Italian uh, explorer or a, a walker rather who uh, uh, was tracked for 1200 uh, kilometers on the uh, uh, the Via Alpina. And uh, the, the remarkable thing is for somebody who was in his mid 60s who hadn't walked that distance before, he adapted to it, uh, the daily rigors within a couple of days, uh, you know, walking 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers a day, day in, day out. Uh, we adapt to that very quickly in a way that we don't adapt to running. Um, now, I'm not against running and I don't want anybody to take the message that I am. But my point here is one of adaptation. It's hard to adapt to run 30 kilometers a day, day in, day out. But you can adapt to walk 30 kilometers a day, day in, day out with relative ease. And you can do it in groups, in families, carrying things, swallowing food while you're walking. Uh, again, something while looking at the horizon because of the position of our gullet and uh, our eyes. Uh, you know, birds, when they swallow things, they have to throw their heads back. Uh, other creatures typically do that. But we have, that, again, this other interesting advantage that we can eat and walk at the same time and keep an eye on what's going on around us. It's, it's hard for other animals to do that. Um, but what we've done is create an environment, again, you know, this evolutionary tendency to conserve energy where we eliminate movement. So we've invented, the, uh, you know, so other means of transport. Uh, obviously, we co-opted uh, uh, horses and oxen and those kinds of things. Uh, we invented bicycles, um, and then we made, made those electric or motor powered <laughs> uh, to cut out some movement. We invented cars uh, and, of course, trains and buses and, and other things. So the, the result is that we end up as adults, on average, walking somewhere around about four to 6,000 steps a day which is nothing compared to what we are capable of doing. Um, and that, that really is, is uh, I think, kind of one of the cruxes of, of, of uh, the lack of movement. Yes, that's that four to 6,000 steps a day was something that I first heard you say on Dr. Rungan Chatterley's podcast when I first became acquainted with you, Shane, and I then went on to, to read your book off the back of it. So it shows the wonder of podcasts sometimes, doesn't it? You listen to somebody for an hour and you think, I need to go and hear more of what this gentleman was talking about. And that stat stood out to me so much because in the community that I spend a lot of time, the fitness community, 10,000 steps is held up as this kind of arbitrary goal in terms of we should all be striving towards that or going beyond it, of course. And so for 4,000 to be less than half of that, 40%, that just didn't compute with my experience of what I tried to strive for. But then I think back to my time when I was younger and if I was going to university and I wasn't quite so fitness minded as I am now, I would have maybe walked to the train station, got the train, got off at the stop right beside the university and gone to university and maybe walked up the stairs or got the lift in the library, all these different things where your movement was actually quite constrained. So my step count then, if I was counting or had a pedometer or my phone at the time was high tech enough to count that, I would have probably been in that in that bracket because I wasn't making a conscious effort. And that's one of the big things that the city designs and the environment that we live in leads us to. It leads us to a lot of, unfortunately, conscious personal responsibility to hit, hit a higher step count? Yeah, so uh, the, the, there's loads to unpack there. So my building where I work in Trinity, um, I'm up on the third floor. So if you want to come to me, uh, to my office, uh, come in the front door and there's a lift just there. Uh, if you want to get to the stairs to go up to my, my office, you have to go through four fire doors. <laughs> so the building has not been designed with movement in mind. And I, and I think this is where we need a revolution kind of in city design and architectural thinking, we can get lots of incremental improvements in our walking easily if our environment is designed to allow us to do it. And our environment is not designed to do that. And I think that became very apparent during the pandemic um, where, you know, we, we had a, a two kilometer rule 
uh, at, from your house first, and then it, it was extended out to five kilometers. And it, it became very apparent that this was very, very difficult because things like sidewalks and footpaths weren't designed uh, with the needs of pedestrians in mind. They were designed with the needs of facilitating car movement in mind. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, reclaiming space for people uh, from mechanized transport is, is a really difficult problem. Um, but it's something I think the pandemic has kind of brought to the fore that we need to pedestrianize things. And the reality is that if we make it easy for people to walk, people will walk. Um, you know, so you, you have this wonderful idea from Paris of the, of the 15 minute city. And the idea there is that everything should be within 15 minutes of your front door, your school, your shops, your work. You should be able to just stroll about. And the reality is then you can get in 10, 12, 14,000 steps a day with no trouble at all if it's if the environment is designed for you. But if it's not, you come back to your issue that you actually have to make this conscious effort to crank it up. And the easiest way in my mind to do that is you have this uh, pocket computer, turn the pedometer on, check it repeatedly during the day and get out there and move. Yeah, exactly. That. I, I like the the level of personal responsibility that requires, but equally, I completely agree from a, a societal design with Paris, putting forward things like the 15 minute city. That was something that stood out to me as quite ingenuitive because if you can walk somewhere in 15 minutes, it removes the whole, the whole um, push forward with more um, favorable for public, uh, public transport or for cars, because the whole reason for that is speed. And we're all about efficiency yeah. in the capital society that we live in. And we can bemoan that as much as we like. But if we're not efficient, then it's it, you, know, you kind of lose the argument where they say, oh, well, I can get to work in 15 minutes on this train. If I was to walk, it would be an hour and a half. So you, you, yeah. you lose so yeah, I think I think we need to think about zones of mobility. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you have things set up so that everything is within 15 minutes of your, of your front door, you're not going to take the car because the car is going to be a pain. You probably won't even own a car. So I think walking is is ideal uh, for distances of 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and if you're going out beyond that, well, then little mobile scooters, uh, which I'm a big fan of for a reason I'll explain in a moment, uh, or bikes uh, overcome that. So you've got micro mobility solutions. And then if you if you want to go further, well, then you public transport. Uh, is probably the way to go, or you know, uh, electric bikes or cycle lanes or, or whatever. I, I'll, I'll just briefly say about uh, the the electric scooters. Yes, I, I want to know about the scooters, yeah. Shane. I'm interested. Yeah, I, I, I don't use them myself, uh, but I'm always I, I observe them all the time, and I'm I'm always impressed by the demand that they make on your uh, vestibular system, the system that allows you to balance. And um, I think one of the points I, I, I kind of allude to in the book is the idea that. Um, these systems are all plastic. They can be trained. Um, and one of the big problems that people have with, as they get older is that you, you can have frailty and people become afraid of falling. Uh, so they move less. And because they're moving less, that system goes a little bit uh, awry. Uh, it, 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 it's not as finely tuned as it would be because it needs to be challenged. And I love seeing people on these scooters because they are so finely balanced. Uh, and I just always admire the amount of training that they're giving their balance system because they're moving at you know a decent pace. Um, uh, they have to respond to visual flow around them and they have to maintain a vertical uh, while, they're, while they're moving. It's not a straightforward task. And I, I actually think even though they're not walking, there's a lot of physiological demands on you because remaining vertical is hard. Um, you know, it's it's easy to do what I'm doing. You're standing, I think, but uh, uh, which is to sit. Uh, but to stand and move is not hard or not easy. It's hard for a, a brain to do this. And it's also something that we don't do a lot of in society because, uh, as we both said, you you could potentially get the lift up the stairs to your office and then sit down and then go to the vending machine or have the lunch yeah. that you brought with you at your desk and then go down in the lift and then go home. It's yeah by doing more of these things of course the electric scooters may be like a, a little bit of a, a niche thing that we can maybe develop over time and get more people doing instead of public transport or instead of driving but the the walking piece is certainly something that stands out to me and when we mentioned earlier about running and you were very keen not to demonize it but you were holding up the benefits of walking in a as a kind of a slightly more evolutionary adaptive um activity why is it that walking has become so 
unglamorous when we think of exercise? I oh I I don't know is the honest answer to that. I really don't. And I think I I kind of wrote the book in part to kind of say, look, damn it, this is something uh, we should all be doing. It, 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 and you know, walking uh, is accessible from the very earliest stages in life. You know, you you learn to walk, assuming you don't have an impairment of 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 uh, some description. You typically learn to to walk. Um, uh, at around maybe the age of 10 or 12 months uh, and over the next eight, 10 months, whatever it is, you go from being this kind of slightly dangerous uh, teetering on the edge of disaster uh, kind of creature to uh, uh, a creature that can move with great grace and fluidity. And you can do that from early in life all the way through the whole course of life. Um, uh, you know, and we, the data, for example, again, from hunter gatherers, uh, where they, they, they put trackers on them, show that from about the age of two or three, kids are knocking out eight, 10,000 steps a day um, and all the way through up until the 80s, which I think is the the oldest age group they've studied. Um, again, knocking out eight, 10,000 steps a day. And the, the impact of this uh, on cardiac health is, is really, really remarkable. Um, these people have... Uh, at the age of 80, cardiac health equivalents of a Westerner aged 50. Um, you know, so there's a, something really, really remarkable about getting out there and getting lots of regular movement dispersed across the course of the whole day. And I, I think this is a thing that gym rats, uh, if I might be so bold, yeah, that's the fine phrase, thing, yeah. Uh, don't get, or many of them don't get. They think that, you know, you sit for six hours, seven hours during the day, you get up briefly to have lunch and then you can undo the damage of that uh, by uh, going and spending two hours in the gym in the evening. Every piece of physiological evidence we have on that shows that that's a misconception, that uh, it does not undo the damage. And in fact, uh, what may actually happen to uh, people is they put on weight because think about it. Uh, you go and you engage in some vigorous energy burning activity first thing your brain wants to do is replace that. So you go home and you don't really monitor what you're eating. So you eat some ice cream or whatever it happens to be, and you, you put those calories back. Um, whereas regular dispersed movement during the course of the day, and of course, having periods of intense movement uh, where you're doing weightlifting or you're doing cardiac, uh, or you're putting a degree of cardiac strain on, those are all good things. But don't make the mistake of thinking that Going to the gym three times a week for an hour is going to undo eight hours a day of, of uh, uh, sitting at, uh, around at a desk. It won't. Sedentary <clears throat> living and then a hard bit of exercise and then the, the kind of reward feature in our head where we have hyper palatable food as a, a well done for going and doing the exercise. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's a very common trap that people fall into. And I think it takes more people talking about the benefits of um the big phrase in the fitness community is neat, so non-exercise thermogenic. Yeah. Um, and but that's taken a long time to to to, to kind of take. Yeah, uh, and, and, and people of... don't quite get that. And I, I, again, you know, it, it, just just to emphasize the, uh, the 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 amount of movement required thing. There's there's quite a bit of data now tracking people. Again, mobile phones have become such a, a, a fantastic uh, resource. Uh, looking at morbidity, so your risk of death, uh, especially your all-cause morbidity, depending on the amount of movement that, that you get in. And it appears there's a kind of a sliding threshold that um, somewhere around five to seven and a half thousand steps a day, if you're, especially if you're up around the seven and a half thousand mark, you're cutting your risk of, of uh, all causes of death by about 50%, uh, which is a really, really staggering amount. Um, so the, I think the key message is that, you know, if you're only doing three, four thousand steps a day and you're doing nothing else, that's really, really bad. Um, you know, you're uh, going to see increases in, flam in inflammatory factors circulating in, the, in your body. Uh, you're, of course, going to be putting yourself at risk of, of all sorts of other conditions, metabolic disorder, diabetes, type two, all of these other things. So tracking your movement getting up regularly, not sitting for hours and hours at a time, because standing is a challenge. I, I, I've used that phrase a few times. It's actually difficult to build a standing robot. 
uh, you know, <laughs> one on two feet that's capable of moving. And this is because you've, you've got two different things going on. You've got contact with the ground or with the substrate, and you have a command signal uh, from the brain that's getting you upright. And then you have feedback mechanisms that keep you upright. And if you watch soldiers on parade when they're standing, if you watch them from the side, they sway ever so slightly forward and back. And this is because there's a, 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 a continuous monitoring of your balance and uh, you sway slightly forward and then you're corrected back. And uh, what again, this continual challenge to these systems is what they were built for. Um, and this is why sitting around, albeit an entirely natural and reasonable thing to do, is something we shouldn't be doing as much of. Yeah, and again, it just links back to the evolutionary piece where we're conserving energy for what our mind in its evolutionary yeah. state thinks is the next bit of activity that I'm going to go and do or the next time I need to go and hunt for something. But in fact, you're not hunting at all. You're just going downstairs to the to get. Yeah, that's the exactly the point. You're, you know, your, your cost to get calories is very low now, whereas your cost to get calories uh, back <laughs> in the day was very, very high. I think that's astounding when you share the statistic there around if you can get up to kind of seven and a half thousand, you can significantly reduce your um, potential risk for a, a wide range of factors when it comes to um, ending your life prematurely. So I think that's an incredible um, kind of carrot for people to to, to improve their 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 um, their amount of movement that they're getting in. And I and I've long spoken about the benefits of walking and less formal exercise for calorie expenditure and general physical health and that's something we've focused on but it would be naive for me not to really dive in with you about the the brain side of things so what are some of the standout things that your research has shown in, in this space shane in terms of of changes in the brain yes uh, yeah so that there's lots and lots of things so First of all, the brain, as everybody I hope knows now, is, is not fixed at birth. It's a, it's a plastic organ. Uh, uniquely in the body, it's self-aware. Your heart doesn't know it exists. Your liver doesn't know it exists. But by God, uh, your brain knows it exists. Um, and your brain responds to challenge. Um, and a, a really simple, reliable and regular form of challenge that causes changes in the brain is physical activity. Um, and you can show this in all sorts of ways, but one of the simplest things to, to remark is that you have a very, very elaborate uh, feedback and control system that's involved in movement. Um, and uh, it, it allows you to engage in self-generated, self-propelled movement. Um, you've got a very elaborate system that's involved in figuring out where you are in the environment, figuring out your goals, where you want to walk to, uh, all of those kinds of things, and also involving the coordination of your movement with others. Uh, and again, you know, I, I mentioned robots earlier on. Uh, it's very, very hard to build robot swarms that are uh, continuously monitoring their own behavior and monitoring the behavior of, of uh, the robots around them and then responding appropriately to them. Whereas we've had uh, uh, thousands of years of, uh, in fact, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to sculpt all of these things simultaneously. So let's, let's, let's just think about what's going on for a moment. If I want to get up and move, um, uh, there has to be a command signal coming from somewhere in the brain that says, get up and move. Uh, so that's typically a, an intention formed maybe in the frontal lobes or, or somewhere like that. Um, and that signal is passed to a variety of what are called premotor and motor areas, so areas that are involved in movement. You get up. Uh, that's a challenge to the body, as I've already mentioned. S uh, stability is, is a really important and difficult thing to do. Um, and if, if, if I give you a very simple example of stability, we, we've all seen uh, John Cleese and the, the Ministry of, of Silly Walks. So if you watch Cleese, don't look at his feet, look at his head. Um, and it, it's, it, it, the funny thing to do, of course, is to look at what he's doing with his legs. But look at his head. And what you see is, his head will move up and down, it will rotate, but it will almost always maintain a parallel with the ground. So that if you take a line from the corner of the eye to the ear, uh, that line will almost always uh, be maintained in a stable position in space, irrespective of all the other things he's doing. And this is because to a first approximation, you can think of your head, sorry, your body is being hung out of your head, making contact with the ground. And this is why, uh, uh, if you slip, you slide, the first thing that happens is 
uh, all your reflexes are oriented towards not stopping you breaking your arm. They're actually oriented towards not allowing you to bang your head. <laughs> Because if you don't have a, a functional brain, nothing else matters. Look after, uh, number, one, look after the number one priority, which is... Yeah, uh, and point. then the reflexes, you know, they're, they, they, they will kick in to do all these other things, and they're really, really fast. So that that's kind of the first thing to say, that uh, this is a challenge, and the body responds to that. So we adapt quickly. We can learn to do things which are really weird. We can learn to skate. Uh, we, we can learn to climb trees, you know, we, we can do all sorts of, we can run and hunt, you know, we can walk and hunt, we can persistence hunt, we can do all sorts of things uh, once that command signal is is, uh, uh, is up and running. So that's, you know, that's kind of an inside out view. So think about it from the outside in. So there's lots of things happening. You're getting lots of information from the environment. You're getting what's called optic flow on the eye. So this is a signal about movement. When you, if you, the easiest way to experience optic flow is to walk down a narrow corridor and feel the uh, corridor sliding across your, your retina. Um, we have a, st a stabilizing mechanism, uh, which we're never aware of, uh, that allows us to move even though all of this stuff is happening. And you can show that very easily by rotating your head while looking at something and your eyes will stay fixed in space. Um, but if you push the corner of your eye so that your eye is moving, you'll see the image bounces around. Um, so you have there a phenomenon known as, as retinal slip. So you've got all of this stuff going on and the body and brain loves this. It's designed uh, to engage in it and, and uh, to profit uh, from it. So that challenge is good for you. And just like, you know, if you imagine leaving your bicycle in, in the, uh, the garden shed for a year and doing nothing with it, you go out to it, it's going to be all glued up, um, not challenging these brain and, and behavioral and body systems regularly will cause them to silt up in a, in a variety of ways. Yeah, so constant or regular stimulation enables our mind to function at a higher level, not just, of course, the physical benefits that you and I have yeah. espoused for the last little while. One of the concepts you've written about is how walking facilitates engaged mind wandering. What does this yes. involve? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the, the most staggering studies, in, in for me at least, in neuroscience over the last 25 years, it, it, it should get a Nobel Prize, uh, is this concept of what's called the default mode network. So when you're popped in a, in a brain scanner and you're being asked to do a task, let's say they're, they're running a stream of text on the monitor and your job is to press a button every time a, a word of a particular type comes up, a target word or a color word or something like that. Uh, you'll get activity in different parts of the brain to do with vision, to do with target detection and other things like that. Now, what's your control condition? Well, your control condition is to do nothing. But it turns out when you're instructed to do nothing, you're, you might be lying there quiescent, but actually your brain is burning away like mad. And when, when you stop focusing on a task, doing something, what's called a task positive network, you immediately slip into something else, this default mode. And this is all about uh, the bigger picture of your life. Your brain just doesn't go quiet. Uh, you start thinking about your friends, your family, you think about what you're gonna do when you get out of the scanner. Uh, you think about what you had for breakfast and uh, you think about maybe what you're gonna do this evening. All these other big picture things come on. And again, using mobile phones and using uh, uh, brain scanners, turns out we spend about 40% of our conscious waking time in this default mode. So even though we're just sitting there, we're actually thinking about stuff, uh, all sorts of stuff. So the, the argument I make in the book is that we know the default mode activity uh, is important for creativity in particular. And what you get when you're walking, uh, especially if you're walking in nature, where you've got lots and lots of different kind of random inputs, ones that are in kind of intrinsically pleasurable. Um, you get a focus that is, is kind of directed mind wandering. You can drift in and out and around the particular problem that you're trying to solve, but you're, you're not absorbed in a particular task. And this is because one of the, the uh, wonderful things about the design of our body for walking is we have these things called central pattern generators in our spinal cord. They, like, they work like a clock, they just go tick, tock, tick, tock, and uh, we just walk without thinking about it. Uh, so it gives you this time, it gives you the space to experience lots of different things, and maybe 
just maybe it might help you solve that difficult knotty problem that actually you haven't been able to solve at your keyboard yeah incredibly you're giving yourself space to process all the different ideas that are in your head and by not putting in as much stimulus you're opening your head up to explore things that are almost nagging um, yeah and the, the point again is uh, you know when we're seated we're not making lots of demands on on the brain it, it doesn't have to worry too much about stability you know because the chair under me is going to keep me stable but once you're up and moving uh everything changes in the brain there's a lot more activity right throughout the brain and we can we can show this by doing electrical recordings in the brain you can see that rhythms that were quiescent suddenly come online uh we you can show it using a technique called psychophysics where you can measure things like uh um your thresholds for visual detection can you how quickly do you see something when it when it's moving all there's lots and lots of different ways of of, of tapping into this and and it comes down to this idea that uh lots of the activity that we engage in is intrinsic you know we we get up and do things because our brain is built for us to do those things yeah, exactly that. And equally, one of the things that I was reading in, in your work was when you're walking, your brain's constantly scanning. And when it's doing this, it's almost searching for new information. And that can be a quite a good way for when you're almost needing to feel more creative or think about, like you said, think about other problems. But also, while it's taking in all this new information, it's processing other areas of, of, your, of, of your life as well, which I find fascinating. And one of the ways that I research for podcast guests is of course listening to them on other interviews or listening to the or their audio book or whatever but also sometimes i'll be in nature just with no input whatsoever and ideas will come to me and i'll get my phone out and i'll put my into my notes ask shane about this particular concept and it more comes it comes to me far more than if i was to sit in front of a laptop screen and be like okay what do i want to talk about shane shane about or what do i want to talk about my next guest about there's much more comes to mind when i'm in yeah a physical transition yeah, uh, there's a kind of a passivity about sitting at your computer that there isn't uh, when uh, you, you're out and moving. And, you know, these kind of sub-threshold ideas, uh, which might be there when you're at the computer, aren't going to actually make it into consciousness. But, uh, but when you're up and moving, they've just got a little tickle and then they'll appear in consciousness for you. Yeah, I, I saw you You shared a, a study where the participants were asked to list household items. I think it was after they'd been a walk and their recall was considerably higher for the group that had been actively it, it was, walking. It was creative uses for uh, household items. Oh, that was it, so, yes. Yeah, so alternative uses. So you might be handed you know, a phone, a cup, a saucepan, whatever it is, and your job is to come up with as many uses for that in in. 30 seconds or whatever and people differ reliably in their ability to come up with creative uses some will say well the saucepan is just for uh, heating beans in but others will say no i can use it to prop open the door i can use it to catch the leak they'll come up with lots and lots of things and people reliably differ in how many ideas they can come up with but a prior period of walking boosts creative idea generation even in people who aren't very good at creative ideas uh, they, they will come up with about twice as many ideas as they would have done had they been seated for the same period of time. I and it, it turns out actually that this is true even in older adults. Uh, so there's a replication of that original study was, was conducted comparing people in their early 20s to people in their late 60s and early 70s. And uh, people in that category in the late 60s, early 70s were able to generate about twice as many ideas as the seated uh, people in their late teens, early 20s. So the, the boon is to get up and move. <laughs> um, and it's it's a really good hack for uh, creativity. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of that, Shane. I think when you see those immediate benefits, it probably gives some uh, momentum to any argument you would have with an employer about potentially having walking meetings or having meetings oh, yeah. where you make sure that you don't put meetings between one and two because I want everyone in the office to make an effort to go upside, outside and move and then come back for the two o'clock meeting and they'll be much more fresh, much more creative, much more able to move things forward. Whereas sometimes we get this idea that more time at the desk equals more output quite often. The time yeah, it's, not, it's, the the it's quite the contrary. And, you know, we, we have this, uh, and you see it in, in the media all the time uh, and there's a, there's a big literature on it. You have managers who kind of have this view that 
uh, they are doing their job only when they make sure that people are tied to their desk. Um, and uh, we have to get away from that idea and start focusing on outputs, not focusing on inputs. Um, I, and, you know, you've got all this monitoring software and all these other things that you hear about now, how much does your mouse move uh, during the, the course of the day? And of course, people will just buy rocker plates to uh, move their mouse. Uh, and in the end, does it matter that you do the spreadsheet at two o'clock in the morning or whatever it is that you're supposed to do? The output actually is, is what matters, not uh, being seated at your desk. And, and this business of presenteeism uh, is, is really, really counterproductive. Um, and, and there's a long argument and discussion to be had about it, but I think the, the pandemic in particular has uh, uh, put people in a place where they realize there are alternatives and, and uh, we can we don't have to do things the way that we were doing them before. We can do them in a different way. And that's fine. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope that the pandemic would have an even more profound effect than it has in terms of working setups and uh, how, how things go. And my first graduate role after university was in a, in a business development role and I was working from home and I did all my calls standing up because I'd seen on a YouTube video that you you bring more energy and you bring more enthusiasm and you don't get the afternoon wall that you have. And I've kind of maintained that throughout my corporate career and then in my project stuff like the podcast where I record an interview with yourself while standing because I feel like I have a little bit more energy and I'm a little bit sharper. Whereas, don't get me wrong, if I'm in a podcast studio, which I've been lucky to use a number of times in, in uh, with more locally based guests, I'm sat down. But I still feel that when I'm stood, particularly on Zoom calls for work or for podcast interviews like this, I feel I can bring my best self to the table when I'm when I'm stood. Yeah, and in fact, if if I wasn't doing this uh, in front of my my laptop and we were doing it together, I would actually say let's walk and talk. Or uh, uh, if I, I was recording it, if I was doing it on my phone, I would be in my back garden walking up and down rather than uh, from, your, from your being own, seated. From your own experience writing your uh, your, your, your book, Shane. How, what role does walking play within? Uh, walking is absolutely central to them. Is the, is the truth? Um, I uh, so when I am writing a book, uh, I don't do it on my laptop at first. Uh, I, I take old scrap pieces of A4 paper that have been used for something else, and I make notes with a pen. Uh, I try and sketch out what a book might look like. Uh, I, I, I try and play with them like that. Um, I might put them on on pieces of, of uh, card and move the cards around to see what the, the chapters might look like. And I'll stand when I'm doing that. Um, then I'll sit and read. Uh, I'll make notes. And uh, then I go and I walk and I dictate uh, my notes and I get those uh, typed up. I, I pay somebody uh, who's able to interpret my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my pauses uh, and uh, she does a fantastic uh, job on it and then I end up with big pieces of ungainly slightly unpleasant text and then I sit and I work with those uh, but a lot of the composition is actually uh, uh, walking around the local hill here um, and I'm well used now to getting strange stares <laughs> and things like that and uh, I deliberately don't do it on my phone I, I, I think um, we, uh, the phone is, uh, you know, almost the perfect invention in a way, you know, because it'll do voice recordings, it'll do be a pedometer, it's a device for delivering information, you can watch telly on it, you know, there's so many things, but I'm, I'm actually a, a fan of being a bit pluralistic uh, about these things, so uh, I use a, a nice, simple uh, digital uh, audio recorder that allows me to send the, uh, the voice uh, or the, the voice files, the MP3s or MP4s uh, easily. And I, I think challenging yourself in, in other ways, even if they're small, is a good thing. And, and trying not to just have a little bit of friction, a little bit of grit, that's a, that's a good thing for you. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of that, Shane. And I think separating work and play can be helpful as well because our phone, a lot of the time, it's both work and play. It's yeah. got these apps that we want to go on and get these dopamine hits from the content we're consuming or reading. And then it's got the work aspect where we're maybe answering emails or writing notes for, for an upcoming book like yourself. It's, it's nice to draw the line in this particular piece of equipment. When it comes out with me on a walk, I'm in creativity work thinking yeah, mode rather it, it, than it sets the context for you. And it, it's, it, it has a single function 
it's not going to, you know, so you put your phone on, on mute. Uh, the thing in your hand is not going to ping <laughs> with uh, messages or whatever. Uh, so you're you're in that one zone and uh, keeping in that zone is, 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 is the important thing. And it often take when you're walking, take what, sorry? I said it doesn't take much to take us out of that flow, particularly if it's a task that's quite difficult, like like writing a, a, a large scientific actionable book like yourself, a message on WhatsApp that says, oh, would you like to go for, for, for a drink at the pub later on or do you want to watch this match at the weekend? You're like, oh, great, I'll, I'll turn my mind to that and yeah. it takes you out of... Yeah, what? no, and, and what you don't want to do is, you know, the, there's this guy, Cal Newport, I don't know if you, you've heard of him, but Cal yeah. has this, this great idea about deep work. And one of the things that he, he emphasizes is something that we know from neuroscience and psychology, that really you don't have long bouts of deep work within you. You, you know, you, you can focus for 45, maybe 60, maybe 90 minutes, and then you're, oh, you know, we, we, we have brains that are built that, that go through cycles. Um, you know, the, the, the major cycle that we undervalue is the sleep-wake cycle. We, you know, you need lots of good quality sleep. Um, but the if you're in one of these flow states where you're working very very well what you shouldn't do is interrupt it to do something else because you won't get it back again um you know and it doesn't matter uh to other people that you do or you don't get it back but you'll be very frustrated yeah. uh, by you know that you lost the thought because this thing in your pocket went ping and you know you can answer it in an hour's time and it will make no difference um, and that that's why I, I think not having the phone in your hand when you're dictating is is really, really important. And not using even headphones with or a Bluetooth or whatever. Don't do any of that. Have a dedicated, simple device. It'll cost you 20 quid and <laughs> do it that way. Yeah, and uh, the interesting part about that work around Cal Newport's um, research there was, I think it took us 18 minutes to get back into flow. Yeah, it, it, it. It, it's really, really hard. And you may not have that 18 minutes. You know, you, you might, you know, have other obligations. You might have just one hour to get something done. And what you don't want to do is throw away a third of that hour trying to recapture a state that was going very well until minute 22. And then, oh, God, it's gone. <laughs> 100%. You, uh, you mentioned within the book around mental health and well-being, which is such a huge topic um, for, for everyone, even especially after the pandemic, it seems. What does the science tell us when it comes to things like inflammation and walking? Yeah, so the, the, you, let's be absolutely clear about the science here. Every health agency in the world of any repute recommend regular physical activity for the maintenance of physical and mental health. Um, there, there is just no two ways about this. We, we have bodies that are designed uh, to profit from regular movement. And uh, what we know is uh, that if you engage in regular uh, physical activity, it will damp down inflammatory responses. Uh, it will promote uh, responses in, in the brain and body that are positive for you in, in a whole variety of ways. So I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, there's a class of molecule in muscle or created by muscle called myokines. And these are reparative. Um, they, they signal to parts of the body and brain that you need to repair a tissue because it's been under stress. These are only produced when you contract the muscle. They're not produced when the muscle is quiescent. Um, so they, they are stress induced. So you need the stress of movement to produce this suite of myokines. And the myokines themselves have all sorts of wonderful effects. They, they are anti-inflammatory, as I've said, but they, they also help damp down things like metabolic disorder. Um, they uh, will help uh, repair tissues that have been stressed and damaged. So wound healing uh, will proceed more effectively. And uh, they, they, in addition then to myokines, you've got all sorts of other signaling things going on. So there's, there's a paper which I, I, I love, which is a, a title which I'll translate. Uh, but it, it, it is, uh, say it's called exercise as an immune system adjuvant. So let's unpick that for a moment. Or, sorry, physical activity is immune system adjuvant. What it argues is very straightforward, that um, the immune system itself is stimulated by physical activity. And it's not when you're not active. Um, and we know that people who... Uh, 
during the pandemic who, for example, had uh, very high blood pressure, uh, which is often a, a consequence of, of lack of activity, were at much greater risk compared to people with uh, low blood pressure, people with uh, other kinds of conditions uh, that are metabolically related, again, at, at a higher risk compared to people who, who weren't. Um, and these conditions are changeable because of activity. Uh, you know, So physical activity uh, is very important uh, for all the reasons we've discussed. And just one thing I'd, I'd mention here is that um, we should be thinking about physical activity in its broadest sense for everybody. And so I mentioned a study in the book on uh, movement in uh, people who are uh, older. And uh, the key point from that study is that traffic light crossing points are set for young adults who can walk at a rate of 1.2 meters a second. Uh, but uh, the vast proportion of people over the age of 65 in, in this particular study, which was of several thousand people, uh, where uh, people who walked more slowly than that. So what, what we've said is we've designed our cities and towns around the needs of people who are already physically active. And we're saying to people who have mobility impairments, well, you don't count. And actually, everybody counts. Um, you know, So we, we need to do things like design footpaths so that, that you don't have to step down into the road. Uh, we need to have crossing points that are designed for people who've got visual impairments so they can detect them through their feet. You know, there's all sorts of things that uh, we can do that will make life better for everybody. And of course, when life is better for everybody, that's good for us all individually as well. Yeah, exactly. That, Shane. And I think we're both off the back of this conversation and the, the, the reading of your content are massively in favour of some sort of government intervention to move towards these things. But you have underlined some of the things that you do from a personal responsibility point of view to make sure that you're getting your steps um, to, the, to the level that you want them to be. Things like going through the four fire doors and then taking the stairs up to your office, things like um, going for your walks in between bouts of creative thought. What are some of the other practical implementations that you would maybe recommend for others? Um, I, I, I think, well, there's kind of two different really things to think about here. One is the, the kind of setting factors that are important. So by that, I mean, there are background things that we can do in terms of, of, of uh, looking after ourselves that we really do need to focus on. So uh, I don't talk about it in great detail in the book, but sleep is one thing that I, I think is absolutely vital. Um, it's really hard to engage in any form of physical activity when you're fatigued. Uh, so getting regular, high quality sleep is really important. Now, I want you to think about something here. If you have a pet dog, uh, when it's time for sleep, what does the dog do? It curls up and it goes to sleep. When it's time for humans to sleep, we think, oh, I'm going to watch just another 15 minutes of Netflix. Uh, and then we think, ah, I'll make it up in the morning, forgetting that actually you've got an early morning meeting. So we top and tail sleep uh, and we make up for it with artificial stimulants, which I'm a fan of, by the way, caffeine in particular. I, I love a good cup of coffee. Um, but we do this very, very often. And uh, we shouldn't, actually. <laughs> we should really be getting good quality sleep because it it, it, it impacts on everything else that we do it massively uh, reduces our adherence as well if i sleep poorly my adherence to my early morning walk for 45 minutes is obviously going to be a lot more i'm going to be more grouchy i'm going to be less motivated yeah. to move yeah so that, that that that's kind of one thing i would say and then we we've hinted at it a, a few times here um but the, i think there's a, a kind of a, a greater issue to do with it and this is the easy accessibility of of ultra high processed foods um it's unsurprising that these exist you know combinations of sugar and fat are immensely gratifying um and they're immensely calorie rich and we find them immensely rewarding uh, and the calories are immediately accessible in a chocolate bar or in, in salted caramel you, you get that hit straight away uh whereas if you've had to go out and dig tubers carve them cook them all of that you've had to expend a lot of calories in order to get calories uh, so, uh, and then to digest that food might come with calorific cost as well. Uh, so you, 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 we really do have a food chain issue where in particular high fat carbs are available everywhere and are easily accessible. Uh, whereas the kinds of things that we could and should be eating, which would be very good for us are, are much less accessible. 
Um, and this is really a kind of a social issue uh, rather than just an individual issue. It's easy to say, well, you should buy this. But if you if you haven't got very money, a bag of chips from the uh, the, the chipper for two quid is, is, is going to be a, a solution. So anyway, those are the kind of setting factors, I would say. Uh, and then in terms of your own personal behaviors, I think if you have a smartphone, turn the pedometer on. Um, I, I think check it. <laughs> <laughs> several times during the day uh, if you have a sedentary job and you're working at a computer or whatever get up set an alarm every 45 minutes get up and walk around uh, for even just a couple of uh, moments you know 30 50 60 seconds whatever it is this all makes a huge difference uh, to normalizing all sorts of things that otherwise start to run awry because the, the body is built and the brain is built for regular challenge and if you don't give it that challenge, the systems that it controls start to become a little dysregulated. So those are the kinds of things I would say. I think, you know, if you're going to buy sandwiches at lunchtime, uh, go to a shop or uh, wherever you get your sandwich from that's a bit further away. Don't pretend to yourself that uh, going and grabbing it and sitting down at the desk is a good thing. Uh, go and eat it in the local park if you can. Eat it on the... <laughs> I don't know if you know, again, there's a kind of a, a, a larger context that we find ourselves in that it's, it's, it's hard to do something about. But, you know, again, your phone can be a solution for you. Is there a park hidden behind a building that you've never explored? Uh, you can maybe go there. Um, there, there. There are things maybe that you can do. And I think also something, uh, again, I don't say it in the book, but I think learning to say no uh, <laughs> to demands is actually a good thing as well, uh, and maybe the the pandemic has taught us a little about doing that as well. If you if you have that luxury, that is. <laughs> yeah, certainly, Shane. I think one of the most important things there is checking the data because you can gamify it a little bit and have it almost as like a a target or it's a game. Can I get eight thousand steps before this time by doing this, this, and this? Even though I've got a busy day of meetings, can I? get 3,000 well, steps in one you know, take, you've, you've made a great point there, and let's just elaborate it a little. There's a one way of gamifying, which is which is great, which is to make it a social challenge. There, there are lots of apps that allow you to track what your friends are doing uh, and you them, and you can compete with each other. Obviously, not get too obsessive about it, but uh, <laughs> um, walking, and I think this is the kind of key final message of my book, is walking is social. Uh, we evolved as social walkers, you know, uh, one guy with a spear uh, walking out of Africa conquers nothing. A family group or a tribe walking out of Africa conquers everything because uh, we, we uh, can be together. We can have uh, families together. We can spread out together. We can protect each other. We can do all sorts of things together. So we're really attuned to each other when we're walking. Uh, and bringing a social element into walking is, is, is really, really important. Um, and, you know, to, to, to kind of put it in, in a, almost its most primal sense, uh, when we humans are hacked off about something, what do we do? We walk together in protest. Now, no other species does that. Your, your uh, chimp does not get together with these other chimps and walk uh, in protest against how the alpha male is behaving. But we humans do this. So, uh, and it can be enormously impactful. Uh, it, it can set policy changes in all sorts of ways so i think remembering that walking is social try and do it with others and if you can't do it with somebody else uh make a phone call when you're doing it and talk to them that works too yeah, yeah huge 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 fan of that shane i think uh, we mentioned the pandemic a lot during this but when we were first kind of able to meet up with people again it was outside so you would go walk with your friends i did lots of walking dates as well and they and actually you build quite good rapport with people on a walk together yeah. but we're, we're, we're built that way and you get to know somebody quite quickly and whether you would maybe want to see them again off the back of that so i find yeah. that could be interesting but it seems like we definitely need to organize a, a mass walk to ask the governments to to redesign our cities <laughs> um, um, to make this is the work of generations unfortunately <laughs> we, we'll see what we can do shane and uh the last thing to ask you is um, your, your next book is going to be on um, how and why humans talk to each other. When can we expect that? Uh, all going well. It'll be in, it's with my editor at the moment. Uh, so if everything goes well, we'll have it in uh, first quarter of next year. And kind of um, the, the, the provisional title is uh, sharing what we know. Uh, and it, it's about how uh, we humans 
tell each other stuff all the time. We share what we know all the time. The podcast industry would not exist without <laughs> our willingness to do this. Um, and what I what I do is is build from uh, and tell how it is that we 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 share knowledge. What we know is is what we remember. What we imagine uh, together to create. And I, I, I walk. Uh, it's a it's a slightly uh, uh, arrogant book in a way. But what I do is is I, I take the story from how two people talk together, what happens, all the way up to how we build nations together. Um, so from neurons to nations is the, the kind of trajectory well, of the book. I'm excited to, to, to get my hands on it when uh, when it's available. And for so people- memory, that imagination, to... conversation, all of that, all in one thing. <laughs> Brilliant, Shane. For people that want to continue the conversation with you and maybe let them and share their thoughts on walking with you, where should they head towards? So there's uh, probably- three places to go uh you can catch me on twitter um at shane omara three uh you can catch me on instagram at shane writer uh and if you want my regular newsletter uh just go to brainpizza.substack.com um, oh. it's not intrusive and uh it's a, an email sign up i'll link all three of those in the show notes shane thank you very much for joining me and thank you to you the listener for listening in i'm sure you've enjoyed this one if you have done take a screenshot pop on your Instagram story, tag me at call.cambro and we'll be back to speak to you all again very, very.